Well, welcome for you that are here live. Those of you watching uh, via Zoom, uh, what we're at is we're continuing the conversation that we began or was asked to begin a couple years ago at our annual meeting in 2019 of investigating this role of women in leadership, especially as the Alliance opened that possibility at, uh, in, in 2000. And so since then, we uh, discussed it as elders, we've looked at some uh, articles and books and, and discussed it. We uh, eventually got to the point of inviting uh, Bernie Vanderwall, who's our district superintendent, whose background was in history, particularly with the history of the Alliance, to come and share about the role of women in the Alliance and the um, decision of the General Assembly to open up this space for women. And uh, Bernie came, talked to the elders and their wives in August of 2019, and then in November of 2019, he gave a presentation to our congregation. And one of the things that he said as he was wrapping up, he said, a next step would be to take a look at the New Testament passages that deal with the topic of women in leadership. And so we thought that was a good idea. Uh, I began to think of people that I'd like to, uh, to invite to actually take us through that. And um, actually, uh, Bernie mentioned Paul, uh, Dr. Spilsbury to me. And what was interesting is that way back in 2006, uh, I was at Pecos Monastery and Paul was one of the presenters at the monastery in the, in the spiritual direction program. And so that was my first contact uh, with Paul. And actually, I don't know if you remember, but your presentation was on uh, the book of Revelation. And actually to do a plug, people get the book. Here's the book. The you hey, guy. <laughs> and actually, it was a it was a uh, a very engaging presentation because Paul was opening space that probably wasn't the traditional understanding from the Alliance perspective on the Book of Revelation. And so, anyhow, that was my first contact with Paul. And um, as we made the list, I thought, well, let's just start at the top. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I emailed Paul, and actually, I, I, I'll admit, I wasn't uh, overly optimistic that you would, you would um, say yes, but he immediately did. And so I thank you very much for your willingness to do that. And I think one thing that makes it special for you to do the presentation is because Paul started his career at Canadian Bible College and Canadian Theological Seminary. He moved to Ambrose, and then now he's at Regent College. So not only is he a New Testament scholar, but he's also very um, connected to or, or knowledgeable of the Christian Missionary Alliance. And so I think both of those add, um, will add to the presentation. So Paul, thank you. Now, wait, Jennifer, did you have Paul for a professor? No, no I did not. We have one Ambrose grad here that uh, <laughs> missed your class. But anyhow, <laughs> but anyhow, Paul, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'll let you take it from there. Uh, there'll be time for interaction and, and questions. So, Paul, why don't you just... Ron, could you say a prayer for us as we get started? Absolutely. <laughs> Father, I thank you for Paul. I thank you for the scriptures. I thank you that uh, you've given by your spirit illumination and understanding. And I pray as well for a spirit of unity as we discuss and over this topic. And Lord, I thank you that you can uh, just give us what we need for this time. And I thank you for Paul and his willingness to share. May you bless him and just uh, give him a, uh, just a special sense of what we need to hear as a group today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, well, thanks so much, Ron. It really is a nice uh, connection to reconnect with you after these many years. And uh, let me also say that um, it really is a, a joy to be able to uh, connect with you folks in Yorkton. I, as Ron mentioned, uh, my wife and I lived in Regina for nine years. Both of our sons were born in Regina General Hospital, and they're now um, they're both now in their early twenties. Both have graduated from university, but I those uh, that was a wonderful part of our life to live nine years. I feel like I paid my dues, you know. I'm, I'm South African by birth. That's why I've got a strange accent. Um, but I lived in Regina for nine good years and then 12 years in Calgary after that. 
Um, so, yeah, and um, in terms of Canadian Bible College, um, that was a wonderful time in my uh, ministry and um, knew Bernie Vanderwall and his wife Colleen and their boys very well in that time, and uh, they've continued to be uh, very dear friends of ours. So I'm grateful that he mentioned my name, and um, I'll talk to him later and say, so you got me this uh, gig. I hope that was a good thing. Um, so friends, I'm happy to come in and uh, speak with you on the subject that I know um, can, is, is a very important subject for you, as it is for many churches. Uh, my own church here in Vancouver is an Alliance church. I'm an Alliance, uh, I'm an, a member of the Alliance. Um, our church is uh, 10th Avenue Alliance, or it's now it's just called 10th Church. Uh, but we've been, we've been uh, when we lived in Calgary, we attended uh, Foothills Alliance. My wife was a pastor there. And, um, and now I attend um, 10th Church. Um, although, strangely enough, my wife attends North Shore Alliance Church. Um, that just has to do with her being asked to be a part-time pastor there at the moment. So, so we're we're pretty alliance um, in our um, in our belonging and so on. So feel very much at home with you folks. And uh, you know, sorry that we can't be together in person, but we'll have to make the the most of um, of this connection. Let me just ask: Can everyone hear? Okay, is this is this is going all right? Good. I got Crystal giving me a thumbs up, and people in the room are kind of. Great. So, friends, um, I don't presume to join you today um, as some kind of an expert who's going to tell you what to do. Um, I, I, I'm, I think of what I'm doing here is really to um, kind of lead a Bible study in a way and to kind of take you into um, really some of the key passages that you need to study together and come to one mind on among yourselves. Um, I know that this is a topic that, um, you know, sometimes people have um, very strong um, views on and there can be, you know, multiple sort of perspectives and so on. And um, I, I honor that. I recognize that, you know, each person needs to come to a place of conscience for themselves um, as they seek the Lord's guidance. And I know that it's not just an individual thing, but together you're seeking the Lord's guidance as you want to come to one mind on this important matter. But it is something that you have the freedom to come to your own mind about. And that was one of the things that I'm sure that Bernie Vanderwall would have made clear to you is that there is a certain level of freedom within the Alliance Church uh, to decide on this matter because the churches, you know, the view on this is that there is um, there is leeway and there's a lack of clarity. It's not the sort of thing where there's a hundred percent slam dunk. Here's the answer to all of the questions that you're going to have. And in fact, what I'll try to, to show as well as we talk through this is that the New Testament itself allows for a range of opinion on a number or on this subject, certainly in some other subjects as well. Um, and so I want to uh, focus in on the main passage. The main passage in the New Testament that really deals with this is in the Paul's letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy. But before um, I jump into that, I want to give us a bit of a framing. So I want to give four points of introduction. I'm not going to do a PowerPoint or anything like that, so you're going to have to take notes. And I don't know if this is being recorded, but that's fine if it is, because then you can look at it later on. Um, <clears throat> But the New Testament passage um, that we're going to look at is in is you know the, the, that's the one that I want to spend the most time with. Although um, as I've told Ron, I'd like this to be quite informal, and there'll be lots of opportunity for questions and so on uh, once I've done my talk. Um, <clears throat> but I do want to to dive into First Timothy. But um, as you'll see, it's you know that's not going to answer all of our questions. In fact, it's going to raise a number of questions for us. Um, but I want us to um, not just look at individual verses. The, the, the reason why I want to look at, uh, to go in depth in 1 Timothy is because we always need to understand any particular verse within this broader context. Okay, but before we turn to 1 Timothy, I want to lay out four broad thoughts. Okay, I'm going to make four kind of broad statements that will um, kind of, set us up for our conversation on this matter. Okay, so 
four points of introduction. You know that you're in for quite a long haul when you know the guy's got four points in the introduction. Imagine what's going to come later. But anyway, hang in there, and you know if you want to get up and have a cup of coffee or whatever, you're free to do that. And those of you who are at home, well, you can just do whatever you like. Um, <clears throat> so the first point of introduction is that the New Testament does not provide us with a detailed blueprint or handbook for what church, church government should be like. And I'm sure that you already know that, that whatever form of government we may use for our community, um, the fact is we're all doing our best with the few pieces of information that the New Testament gives us. And our churches are structured in a way that makes sense given the information that we've been provided, but there's lots of variety and of course, that's not surprising given, given you know, the, the 2,000 years of church history and the many different cultures in which the church um, has flourished and so on. Um, and so that, uh, to me, already says that we should hold our own sort of views on this subject somewhat open-handedly because there isn't just one way to organize the church. And a question like, should women be elders, is a matter of church government. It has to do with how should we organize ourselves when we are, you know, when we, as the community, the community of Jesus followers. Um, and so there's, there isn't one clear model that emerges. Um, and so, you know, you might say, well, I don't think a woman should be an elder. And someone else might say, well, I don't think there should be elders, you know, or someone else, someone might say, I don't think women should be ordained. Someone else could say, well, ordination isn't even in the Bible. So who, who you know, there's, there's just a lot of variety. And the, the thing we need to be careful about is to not kind of tie ourselves into a certain model and then ask, are women allowed to do this one thing? When the model itself might actually be something that we've assumed or it's been, it's something that we've inherited because this has been a good way that it works over a long period of time, but it may not itself be uh, firmly rooted in the scripture. So there are many things about the New Testament that, or sorry, about the church in the New Testament that aren't entirely clear. There's lots of questions that the New Testament doesn't answer. Fundamental things like, you know, what kinds of ministry should a church have? Most churches have got ministries, youth ministry, ministry to uh, maybe the elderly, ministries to women, ministries to, um, you know, the poor and so on. There's no specific list or rule about what kinds of ministries that a church should have. Should churches have full-time paid pastors? You know, many of our churches have that, but that's not something that's in the New Testament. New Testament supports the idea that you should, you know, support the people that serve you. But there isn't any such thing as a full-time paid pastor or even ordination for that matter in the New Testament. What kind of music should be played in churches? Is there an optimal size for a church? Like should a church be allowed to become a mega church or not? That sort of thing isn't in the New Testament. Should churches own property and real estate? You know, that's that's a big thing. I mean, in the in the book of Acts, the churches, the, the community, you know, they sold everything they had and and you know shared everything in common. And yet many of our churches own real estate in some places. Churches are very wealthy because of their real estate holdings. Is it appropriate for churches to get tax breaks from secular governments? You know, we all benefit from that and it's kind of nice to get it, but is it actually a legitimate thing? I'm not going to answer any of those questions, but you know, it's just an example of how many things that we do as churches that aren't specifically governed by, you know, by verses or, you know, it's more about how a, um, an understanding of the church has developed over a long period of time. And over the centuries, followers of Jesus have organized themselves in very different ways as best they could, all with good reasons drawn from the Bible. So on the one hand, you could say if there's a spectrum, some groups emphasize the spiritual authority of individual believers. They may not have authority structures or elaborate rules of governance and so on. They may think of themselves as being led by the Spirit in a very direct way and rely on the gifts of the, Spirit, of the Spirit manifested in each believer. You could say that's on one side of the spectrum. On the other side of the spectrum, you might say, there's a great deal of emphasis placed on structures and authority and on um, you know, certain offices like bishops and archbishops and so on, or superintendents or 
um, you know, senior pastors and elders boards and so on. Um, and in those cases, sometimes you've got not just local church government that's very structured, but then the overarching church structure that's, you know, very uh, formalized, um, where you've got, you know, a bishop who's not just the boss of a church, but in fact is the overseer of a whole province, a whole region. And most of our churches are somewhere in between with lots of variation from one group to another. And I know that you've heard from Bernie Vanderwall and you know all of this anyway, but the Alliance denomination has got a form of government in which, you know, board of governors often, but not always chaired by the senior pastor leads individual congregations. We might call this a Presbyterian form of government because there's elders that sort of lead the congregations. Um, and where each church sends delegates to a biennial general assembly to deliberate on rules that apply to all the churches. So there's certain things that apply to everyone. And it's kind of a voluntary association where you say, we, we choose to, to be associated with this whole family of churches, not just individuals. And we, in a sense, um, ask the bigger group, this, this general assembly, to deliberate at that higher level in order to kind of work out plans and pathways that all of the churches in this family will follow. So that's broadly speaking is regarded as a, um, as a pres Presbyterian form of government. But there's sort of variations that are unique to the Alliance because the Alliance has also got a very strong emphasis on the gifts and leading of the spirit, not just at the general assembly. You know, it's not just once every two years at general assembly where suddenly the spirit arrives. We believe that the spirit is actually present in individual believers and the spirit shows up in Sunday by Sunday and weekday meetings and all over the place in, in kitchens and in living rooms and so on. Um, and so there is a strong recognition in the Alliance that local communities um, are very much a part of discerning the will of God for their situation and for their circumstances. So there's a kind of balance that happens. And I think it's very healthy balance between this kind of, broad oversight that's offered by general assembly and you've got structures that are you know there's not just um there's also the provinces you know there's the districts and the superintendents and all of that they're sort of like bishops in a way but not quite i haven't got around to calling bernie van a bishop yet and as far as i know he doesn't wear a purple shirt but he might it might be you know an undershirt i'm not sure um but so this is this is kind of leads us to you know why we're having our conversation today, because the Alliance has actually allowed individual churches, communities of Jesus followers, like you folks there in Yorkton, you know, you've got the freedom to make a decision around something like, will we have women on our elders board? And it's precisely because the Alliance says this is a matter on which there ought to be local buy-in and local kind of being of one mind. It's not enough just for the sort of the, the bigger community and the wider space to have come to a decision that allows for this. Now in your local setting, you need to grapple with scriptures too, but you don't do it sort of as, as a independent group, you do it as a group that's sort of part of this family. And so, you know, I think it's really great that you've been, that not only have you been doing reading and you've been deliberating together, but you invited Bernie to come and, you know, so you've already kind of heard from the denomination what their point of view is. And it, it sounds to me like you're doing things in exactly the right way. And so I'm glad to be a part of this as well. Um, but now one of the implications for all of this, the reason why this is a matter of sort of that's open to uh, individual conscience is partly because there isn't a slam dunk knockdown argument that makes it clear what you should do in every situation. And so I would just urge us all not to think of this as some kind of, you know, kind of debate or argument where, you know, looking for some kind of slam dunk or a gotcha moment or something like that, where something's going to win the day and someone's going to lose an argument. But it's really about seeking to come to a, uh, a unity of mind uh, for your community in the, in the context of how you've come to think about who you are as a church, what it is that the Lord is calling you to, and what is the mission of the church, um, not just worldwide, but certainly that's part of it, but also what is the mission of your community there in Yorkton? What is Christ seeking you to, to be and seeking from you to be and to do and so on? Um, and so, you know, I, I think that what we need to all be praying for is that we can 
speak together, pray together, um, reason together, and ultimately come to a conclusion that brings all of you together in the spirit of Jesus. Okay, so that was my first point of introduction. I told you this is going to be quite a <laughs> quite a thing. That was one point, and that has to do with the fact that there isn't one. Um, oh, you know, there isn't a slam dunk New Testament model that you have to follow. The second point that I that is very important for us to understand is that the New Testament is not a law book. Okay? The New Testament is not a law book that tells you the laws you have to follow. You know, it's not it's not a manual. It's not like you know, here's the manual for what are the rules and instructions. You know, sometimes folks talk about the Bible that way. They say it's, you know, it's a rule book, it's God's instructions to us and so on. But really it is, um, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's given to us by God. Um, but these are, um, these are a range of different kinds of documents. There's gospels, of course, which are um, accounts of the life and death of Jesus and resurrection, of course. And they're letters. Many of the documents in the New Testament are letters which show communities grappling with these very kinds of things that you're grappling with here. And there's real life circumstances and situations that play into all of the things that are going on. And you find there's variety, there's different ways of saying things in different places. Um, there's not just a strict law. Okay, the New Testament isn't a law book that just gives you, you know, introduction, you know, all the preamble stuff. And then, you know, he has all the stuff you needed to know about this, you know, about God and then about Jesus and then about, you know, ethics or something like that. It's, there's a much more of an informality about the New Testament, which matches the informality of these first Jews, Jesus communities that we're so interested in emulating and learning from. Um, but the New Testament makes it very clear that communities of Jesus followers seek to live by the spirit of Jesus, rather than by a strict legal code, right? That's the kind of irony of it. Sometimes the New Testament, which is telling us to live by the spirit, we then use it to live by the law. And we need to be careful not to fall into um, the kind of trap of treating the New Testament as if it's a new book of law. The New Testament itself, like 2 Corinthians 3 verse 6, for example, says that we live by a new covenant not by the letter, but by the spirit for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And so that's an interesting dynamic for us to grapple with, right? We want to learn from the scriptures. We want to learn what the Bible tells us and yet to um, avoid falling into a kind of legalism that burdens communities with tight rules rather than allowing them to thrive in the freedom of the spirit. So, and that's, that's the kind of uh, balancing act that, you're all working with is like we have been called to be a community of the spirit that's led by the spirit and yet we believe that the spirit has given us the scriptures so we take the scriptures seriously and we study them carefully and we want to uh, live by what we learn there but we need to do it we need to apply the scriptures in an appropriate way and in a way that is um, in sync with the truth of the gospel which is that we have been set free, we live by the spirit and not by the law and all of that. So this, that's, that's one of the challenges that we have is to live in communities um, that are guided by the spirit. Okay, so that was my second point. The third point of introduction is that Jesus explicitly empowers the church to make decisions for themselves. Okay, Jesus gives the right to you folks in Yorkton and to us here in Vancouver and anywhere else, um, it gives us the authority to think about important things and come to these kinds of decisions. Twice in the Gospel of Matthew, I might want to just think about the Gospel of Matthew for a while. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, and in Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, Jesus says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And here Jesus is entering into the realm of the, the application of uh, scripture to everyday life. Um, the terms binding and loosing were used in ancient Jewish interpretation uh, to designate whether a scriptural rule was applicable 
in a given circumstance or not. So, for example, the rabbis might insist that the law forbidding work on the Sabbath was binding even with regard to travel on the Sabbath because travel was a kind of work. So, you know, the ancient Jewish communities were trying to live by the Old Testament as if the Old Testament was a law book. Okay, so they lived by the Old Testament as law. And, but they had to decide, okay, if it says you have to observe the Sabbath, well, what does that mean? Does the, does the law apply to travel? And most of the, the rabbis would say, yes, the law about the Sabbath is binding and you have to, it, it applies to travel. But by the same token, they might decide that the law is not binding for certain kinds of travel or for travel for certain kinds of purposes. Like for example, if a person needs to travel to get to the emergency because someone's dying or having a baby, are you allowed to do that? That sort of thing, the rabbis would say, yep, that's not binding. You're loose with the regard to that because that's a specific case. And so then you, there would be freedom to travel, even though in another case, traveling was breaking the Sabbath, but in this case, you wouldn't be bound. And there are lots, there are in the Talmud, which is the Jewish um, book of tradition, comes from the third and fourth and fifth centuries and so on. It contains hundreds of decisions regarding the application of the law to all kinds of, you know, to everyday life. And um, Jesus is himself engaged in these kinds of conversations in the Gospel of Matthew. And Jesus often criticizes the Pharisees because he regarded them as often misapplying the laws and making the laws overly strict. In fact, Jesus says that they made void the word of God for the sake of their own tradition. So the Pharisees, Jesus regarded as kind of off base because they were always making the wrong applications and they were making the law too burdensome for the people to actually uh, live by. But sometimes Jesus himself is quite strict himself, as you, you will recall. So, for example, you know, the Old Testament has got a law that we all remember very well that forbids adultery. And Jesus says that the law against adultery is binding even on what you think about. So that even lustful thoughts count as adultery. That's an example of saying the law about adultery is binding even if you think about adultery. That's a very strict application of the law. But in another case, Jesus is very loose in his application of the law when he says that the Sabbath does not restrict the person from doing good. So the Pharisees were saying, you're not allowed to heal someone on the Sabbath. Jesus says, sure, you can do. You can heal people on the Sabbath. The law isn't binding when it comes to doing good on the Sabbath. So Jesus heals people on the Sabbath. It's not that he regards the Sabbath law as, um, as a dumb law. Jesus honors the law. In fact, he says in, in, in Matthew that he has come to fulfill the law. Um, but the law has to be applied in different ways in different situations. And that's what it means when Jesus says that, you know, whatever you bind on earth will, will be bound in heaven. Because Jesus is saying, you, the community, have to make these kinds of decisions as well. You also will need to think through, well, does this rule apply in this situation and how does it apply in that situation and so on. And the reason why Jesus gives this ability to the church is because, as he says in chapter 18, that wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with you in the midst of you. Right? So Jesus, because Jesus is in the community and we gather in his name and we seek to make these important decisions, we know that we are being led by Jesus himself. And so that we've got the authority to make a rule about something. And then if we make a rule, then it's, that's the rule and we will be held accountable for it. If you bind it on earth, it will be bound in heaven. That means God will take seriously the rules you made for yourselves. And if you loose it on earth, it'll be loosed in heaven. God will say, okay, you gave yourself a little bit of leeway there. Fair enough. But there has to be some kind of principles that will guide us, right? So it's not just a matter of, well, I'm just going to make up my own rules, because it's always doing it in the company of Jesus, right? It's the, wherever two or three are gathered in my name. 
What does it mean to gather in Jesus' name? It's to think through things in the way, um, you know, Jesus is with us literally in the spirit. And we are being led by his own spirit and his own teaching. Now, of course, there, there are principles that the gospel of Matthew gives us. Jesus summarized the whole law by, for example, the, uh, the golden rule, which says that, um, you know, whatever you want uh, someone else to do, that, you know, treat others the way you would like them to treat you. That is not just a nice rule, but Jesus says, this is the law and the prophets. Um, in everything, do to others as you would have them do to you, for this is the law and the prophets, is uh, chapter 7, verse 12. And then, of course, there's also the double command to love God and love your neighbor in chapter 22, verse 40. And it says, because on these two commandments hang all the other laws. In other words, some laws, the law to love God and love your neighbor, is the framework within which to look at all the other laws. So some laws, frankly, then are the foundation and are built on that foundation, and other laws are not the foundation. So the key thing is to really focus in on the foundations and the most important principles, and then the other things are sort of, they fit into the structure that you have discerned as being at the bottom of it all. It's the most important things. Um, And so, for example, Jesus criticized the Pharisees because they were so detailed about the laws. He says in chapter 23 that they tithed even their herbs and spices. They tithed mint and dill and cumin. Imagine that. They were so detailed in their, you know, we're going we're gonna to be law-abiding people. We're going we're gonna to, de- you know, every little thing they had following the law. And then Jesus says, but... They neglected the weightier matters of the law, which are justice, mercy, and faith. And you can see there that Jesus doesn't treat all the laws as if they're equally weighty. He says there's some weighty matters. The weightier matters are justice, mercy, and faith. And then there's details of the law, which Jesus says you should, you know, you shouldn't just uh, disregard them, but you need to put them in the right perspective. And it would be a shame if you were really good at tithing mint, but, you know, weren't that good at justice. It would be much better if it was the other way around. If you were good at justice and maybe your tithing of mint was a bit off, that wouldn't be as big of a deal, right? And so sometimes we like to say, well, you know, the laws are all equal and so on, but Jesus doesn't treat them that way. Jesus has got the foundational laws, and then there's the other laws that fit within that framework. And that's you know, that's kind of inevitable because it's not possible to, you know, have a system of life in which hundreds of different principles are all equally important because it, would, it wouldn't be possible to create a community and to live an ordinary life, and you know, a normal life in that kind of an environment. Okay, so that was my third point, is that Jesus gives us the authority to bind and to loose according to the will of God. And the will of God is what is revealed to us in scripture. Okay, so three points of introduction, and there's one more to go. Um, the question for us is, what is, that, what is foundational for us as we come to think about something like, should women be elders? What is the foundational truth through which we view the New Testament? So this is my fourth point, is... Um, you know, what is the foundational, or what, what is the lens, you could say, through which you look at all of the questions that you want to look at? And what I want to say here is that it's vital for us to be not a list of do's and don'ts, but really as a grand story of God's redeeming love that comes to full expression through the person and work of Jesus. Okay? The New Testament or Scripture as a whole is is a story of God's redeeming love. It's not, a, it's not a list of do's and don'ts. It's, I mean, you just pick up the Bible and you'll just see there are a few do's and don'ts, but that's by no means the main thing that the New Testament is. The New Testament is a grand story of God's redeeming love that comes to full expression in the person and work of Jesus. There's one story that runs from creation through the fall and to the patriarchs, from there to Egypt, slavery, the exodus, 
and all the way up through the history of Israel and the exile and return from exile to the person, to the life, the death, the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. And within this story, the church is seen as the community of those who belong to Jesus and who are being called not only to become more and more like Jesus, that's part of what the story is, and we're being called to be more and more like Jesus, but also to mirror Jesus, to be an image of Jesus, to be just as we are made in the image of God. Now in the new creation, we are made in the image of Christ and are reflecting Christ to the world. Um, and we do this um, because of the presence of the ongoing um, Holy Spirit who is with us in these communities that we all have the privilege to be a part of. So this vocation of being the image of God and the image of Christ in the world is possible only because Jesus himself continues to be present with us. Jesus is not only among us collectively, but he's also within us individually. And this work of the Holy Spirit, who not only unites us with Jesus at the time of our conversion, but immerses us into a new community that Paul calls the body of Christ. So when we come to faith in Jesus, we are joined to Jesus. Being joined to Jesus means part, being a part of his body. Being a part of his body means we are also joined to others. And so this is a fundamental part of the story um, that is being told in the scriptures. And um, so we are part of the body of Christ, a, a body that is filled with the Holy Spirit. That, and it, it is a body that seeks to live, well, lives in union with Christ. Um, it doesn't live by law, which kills. It lives by the spirit of Jesus. It's the spirit of Jesus that keeps us alive and animated and um, doing ministry and reaching out to people. The church is the ongoing presence of Jesus in the world. So as members of the body of Christ, we are all providentially, that means by God's providence and God's sovereign grace, we're all gifted to fulfill distinct yet interconnected roles. And you know all about this. You read it, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, that there are many functions within the church, each one of which is gifted specifically by the Holy Spirit, and they all work together in this interconnected body-like way. The overarching principle, therefore, is that each person is under divine obligation to fulfill the task or role which they've been called and gifted to do, right? It's not just that, oh, well, if you want to, you can be, you know, um, a pastor, or you can be a, someone who helps, or you can be someone who prophesies, or you can be somebody who had, is an administrator. No, these, these gifts are given with divine strings attached. We are called to do these so that the church can function as the body of Christ in a place, so that the work of the gospel can happen, that the, the kingdom can arrive it can spread among the world and so on. So there's a divine obligation that we each have to live within the gifting that we receive from the Holy Spirit. And our, our identities now are shaped by this life in the Spirit. This life, we could say, is in Christ, that we are called to be a member of the body of Christ. We are part of a new work that God is doing in the world. And Paul calls this a new creation. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. That's a radical and amazing way of thinking about it, that there's a whole new creation. First creation began way back then, with, and you know, Adam and Eve were in that story, and now we're in a new creation, and there's a new identity, a new way of thinking about each other. And in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, still along in this theme, Paul says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith, for all of you were baptized into Christ. It means you were joined to Christ. You were united, united with Christ. You have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so we don't have the old sort of identities that we had before, Jew, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, even male and female. In this new creation that is being made, there is a new way of thinking. It's a, it's a way that sees people where their primary identity is who they are in Christ. 
and how they have been gifted and called by the Holy Spirit within this um, wonderful new creation. Okay, so now when I read the New Testament, that's the way that I come to the specific rules and regulations about what church life should be like. I think about it in the light of this picture of the one story that leads to this amazing account of our being united to Christ and becoming members of the body of Christ. Um, and when I need to weigh, okay, here's one bit that says this, and here's another bit that says that, how will I decide which one is weightier than the other? It's, it's really important to have this kind of a, of a big picture framework um, within which to place all of the other smaller details. So those were my four points um, that uh, I wanted to just use as, as a way of introduction. So that leads us now to 1 Timothy. And what I want to do in the case of 1 Timothy is I want to lead you through thinking about the specific difficult passage, but to see how it fits within a whole setting of a community um, there in, um, in Ephesus. Paul, Paul is writing to Timothy. Timothy's in Ephesus. Um, he's got a specific task that he needs to um, undertake. Now, of course, as I'm sure you're all aware, the critical passage for us as we think about women as elders and so on is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, which says this, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. And that is often seen as the kind of the crux of the matter um, as to you know whether or not women can be in ministry, for example, whether whether women can preach, whether they can be pastors, and um, whether or not they could be elders in a church. So it really is important for us to understand um, where that verse and how that verse fits. Of course, there's other verses like in First Corinthians chapter 14, verses 33 and 34, which also says that a woman should be quiet. Um, but there's a slightly different setting, and we can talk about that a little bit later on. But I want to focus on First Timothy. And so if you've got your New Test, if you've got your Bible with you, I'd, I'd encourage you to get it out, because I'm going to take us through a kind of uh, journey through First Timothy. This is going to be like a, um, a Bible study. Um, and I want to show how it's, I mean, first of all, maybe just one of the my um, key principles is that you can't understand one verse in isolation from everything else that's around it. And we need to understand that Paul was writing to real communities, real people that he knew um, where they've got a history and they've, they've got, you know, there's a whole community life just like you folks do there. And so um, we need to understand why Paul is saying what he says to these folks in this way, um, in this passage, given what we are, have already seen, that Paul has said, you know, in Christ, there's a new creation. And in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, nor male nor female, and so on. So how is it then that he has these, this very strong thing to say about women not being able to teach? So um, let's dive in to this whirlwind study of... Are you all with me still? Okay, you doing all right over there? It's hard to get any uh, read of body language, you know? You guys are all masked <laughs> and at a distance, but I, I hope that you're following along okay. Um, so I'm gonna take us through a kind of working our way through First Timothy, and I wanna end off by coming back to this passage that says that women um, should not teach or have authority over a man. Um, Okay, so first thing to realize, and um, you may have you know, done a study on 1 Timothy before, but just as by way of reminder, is that Paul has sent Timothy to Ephesus in order to deal with a problem in the church. So Timothy is not the pastor of the church. He is a delegate from Paul. He's Paul's delegate who's gone there. So Paul has created a sort of network of communities. And that in itself is not, you know, that's kind of, it's not a denomination or anything like that, but there's a network of Jesus communities that Paul has established. 
And there is some kind of ongoing sort of loose connection between these different communities. We use the word church, but you know, you you think of it much more as like a, a network or a, you know, an affiliation of, of uh, like-minded people or something like that. And so Paul says in chapter one, verse three, I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and in endless genealogies. So Paul has himself traveled to Greece, that's Macedonia. So if you look on a map, Paul has gone from Ephesus around the uh, Aegean and he's sort of, he's gone over to, to Philippi or Thessalonica, somewhere like that. And from there, he's writing and he's saying, I left you behind in order to deal with this problem. And the problem is that certain people are teaching false doctrine. So the, a key part of the setting of, of 1 Timothy is that there, is, um, there's, there are teachers who are teaching false doctrine. And Timothy's job is to strengthen the church to resist this false teaching that's happening. Um, if you go down to verse six in that same passage, it says some have departed from a good conscience and so on, uh, and they have turned to meaningless talk. Okay, so there's another indication of this um, false teaching. But if we skip ahead a bit, if you go all the way down to um, chapter four, chapter four, verse three gives you gives us a little bit of an insight of what the false teaching is about. Now, the false teaching has to do with um, um, it, it has to do with a worldview, okay? And the worldview that these false teachers have is that it's you know it's hard to tell exactly because we aren't given enough information, but it's it's along the lines that the only thing that's important is spiritual things, and that anything that is in the body is a bad thing, and so that includes. Um, family life and having children and sort of living a an ordinary domestic existence um, in communities. So these sort of hyper spiritual people have come along and have saying something like the only thing that matters is your spiritual life. Um, it's a kind of gnosticism. It's with an overemphasis on spiritual knowledge. So it says in chapter four verse three, they forbid people to marry. And they order them to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. So notice how they are forbidding people, telling them that they be into ascetical practices. That means not eating. So, um, you know, denying themselves food um, because presumably this will make them pure in a spiritual sense. But there's an anti um, you could say anti-family attitude and potentially anti-domesticity, um, anti anti-marriage, anti-children, you know, don't propagate the community by having children and so on, because they forbid marriage. In other words, they think that the flesh is a bad thing. And by flesh, I mean sort of bodily life. They think that bodily life is a bad thing. Now, we know that there were people in the ancient world that thought this way. They thought that the mind and the spirit and what was in your heart was important and that the body is a kind of a, um, the body is um, corrupt. The body is um, a weight that keeps you from God and you need to somehow escape from your body in order to flourish. Now, back in chapter one, um, we see that these people are, who are teaching are claiming to be experts in the law. Okay. Um, they are claiming to, um, to, to kind of have special insight. Um, so if you go back to um, verse 4, it says, um, there's these people, they teach false doctrines. They devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Um, they, it says, verse 6, some have departed from these. They've turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. Then Paul says, we know that the law is good if one uses it properly. And there's, there's a place for the law, but one has to be careful how we use it. Um, 
We also know that the law is made not for righteous, but for lawbreakers and for rebels and for the ungodly and sinful and so on. Down to verse 10, it says that, um, and for whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, the law is there to stop us from kind of going astray. Um, anything um, that doesn't conform to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God. Okay, so the first point in all of this is to say that the reason why Timothy is in Ephesus is because there are false teachers who are denying the value of the body and of family life and of being married, for example, and having children. And they are claiming that their teaching comes from the law. They're some kind of highfalutin sort of super intellectuals or something like that. Now, Paul's strategy to, um, to stop this false teaching, of course, is to, is to strengthen the leadership of the community in Ephesus. And that's why 1 Timothy is so important for us in this topic, because here's where Paul, Paul actually talks about, gives us some insight into how the, lead, how the community in Ephesus was structured. So we'll skip our, ahead now to chapter 3, because chapter, we'll come back to chapter 2 and the, and the women and so on in a bit. But in chapter 3, you've got Paul laying out the um, sort of a basic structure that he assumes that they have. He doesn't say this is the way all churches everywhere have to be. But in Ephesus, Paul is telling Timothy, look, you need to have some people there that you can trust, that you can rely on to help this community not get sucked into this false teaching. So in chapter 3, verse 1, it says, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. He talks about an overseer. He says, now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own fa family well and see that his children obey him. He must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert. Um, he may, or he may be conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Okay, so that's the first kind of point that Paul makes is that, look, if someone in the community that fills this kind of list of, you know, kind of uh, virtues and or kind of character qualities if they want to be an overseer, that's a good thing, and you should encourage that. Okay, so um, it's a good thing for, for someone to want to, to be an overseer. Now, the word that's used for overseer there is the Greek word episkopos, from which we get the English word episcopal, which, as you may know, is a, is a name for a, for a bishop. Um, so sometimes, and in the old, older translations, the word here was bishop. If someone aspires to be a bishop, you know, they aspire to, to a good thing. But that word has become something different now. Like in English, the word bishop is not helpful for us because it makes us think that the person that Paul is talking about here is someone who's got, an, who's got a job, an actual office, you know, that this is something that's very highfalutin and formalized. Most likely this person was a part of a group that had um, some kind of, you know, authority in the church. But it's, you know, Paul's communities are a network of sort of affiliated groups that they, they don't have authority in the way that you would think of as a bishop having. In fact, a, a uh, translation for this word, my, the NIV says overseer, but another English word, that could just as easily be used to translate this is the word supervisor. The English word supervisor has got the same meaning, the same root meaning as the word overseer. So you could just as easily say, if someone wants to be a supervisor, that's a good thing. And then it lists all of these rules about what they should be like. Now, if you look through those rules of what they should be like, it's quite a long list, but they're pretty basic things, you know, like you shouldn't be drunk, um, you shouldn't be violent. You shouldn't be devoted to money. You know, you shouldn't be a, adulterous and so on. Like 
these are this is basic set of, of qualities for a person who is going to be a supervisor, someone who's kind of takes leadership um, in this kind of network that we're talking about. Um, and then he uses a different um, sort of category in verse eight. He says, in the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there's nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. Now, that word deacon, as I'm sure you know, because you have deacons in your church, the, the Greek word is diakonos, and it means servant. Um, but it can also mean something as simple as helper. So in my notes, I've written in pencil here, you know, you've got the supervisor and you've got the helpers. And that's basically how simple Paul's communities are. They're supervisors and helpers. And together, you know, they're all supposed to be thinking about how we're going to keep this church on track. There's certain things that have to be done, of course. There's caring for people, there's loving people. And there's, the key thing for Paul is that these people are going to keep the church from going down the road of following these false teachers that have come into the community. Now, notice verse 8 said, in the same way, the deacons are to be worthy of respect. Then verse 11 says, in the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect. And so there's a debate, and I know that you've thought about this. Is it a, there's a debate here whether the women being referred to here are women deacons or whether they are the wives of the deacons. I think it's probably a both and. It probably the wives of the deacons were themselves also deacons. And any woman in the church could be a deacon. Um, and the reason for that is because they are just included here among these people who are called deacons. Because if you, look, if you go down to verse 12, it goes back to just saying, talking about men again. It says, a deacon must be faithful to his wife, must manage his children and his household well, and so on. So there's some more rules. And it's like right in the middle of that, it specifies the women. So I think it's pretty clear, although I mean, not absolutely it's slam dunk, but that the women that are being spoken to about here are thought of as among those that are deacons. Now, something that supports that is Romans chapter 16, verse 1. If you go over there, you'll find somebody called Phoebe, who is part of Paul's network. She helped to actually spread Paul's mission. Paul calls her a benefactor. She was a benefactor of me, Paul says. In other words, she's a wealthy business person who actually is helping to bankroll Paul's mission. And another person like that is Chloe in 1 Corinthians, also a wealthy businesswoman who is helping to bankroll Paul's mission. But the thing that's it's important about Phoebe is that in Romans 16, verse 1, Paul explicitly calls her a deacon. And he uses exactly the same word that's used for the men here when he says that, you know, deacons need to be like this. So it just shows you that there could be variations in different places. But in this case, Paul says to Timothy, you should you know, kind of create a little structure in which there are overseers or supervisors and helpers. And these folks are going to help you to keep your, this church um, on the straight and narrow. Now, so far, Paul doesn't say anything about elders specifically until we get to chapter four. And, um, here Paul is encouraging Timothy not to be intimidated by the fact that, you know, he is being sent to this church and he's supposed to be teaching them and guiding them and so on. He's a fairly young guy himself. And so Paul is worried that Timothy is a little bit shy and maybe a bit nervous in the setting. And so he reminds him about the gift that he has within him, that he himself is a gifted person and that he's had prophecy said over him and so on. And so in chapter 14, chapter 4, verse 14, it says, Do not neglect the gift which has been given through prophecy when the elders, the body of elders, really, it's kind of like the, the word that's used there indicates that it's a sort of like a group. The body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourselves wholly to them and so on. These are things that Paul is telling Timothy that he needs to do. So. That's kind of interesting because then it tells us that there seems to be also you can call about some group within the church as elders. 
but he doesn't specifically make clear who the elders are. My own understanding of this is that the elders probably, not a 100% done deal, the elders probably are the same people that he's referring to back in chapter three, where he says that, you know, certain people should be overseers and maybe even including the deacons. In other words, there's overseers and deacons, and together those people are the ones that are giving oversight to the church, and though they could be called the elders. The reason why I say that is because what happens in chapter five is that Paul says, do not rebuke an older man. Um, and the word that's used for older man is the word the same word that's used for elder. So the word presbyteros, from which we get Presbyterian, which is translated elder, is just it means an older man. But in the very next verse, it says, you should treat older women. And there it's just the feminine form of the same word, presbyteros. You should treat older women as mothers. Um, so you could argue that the presbyter, the, the board of elders, is simply the older men and older women in the community who should be treated with respect. And those are the very people who could be described as either being overseers or helpers back in chapter three. Now, that isn't a kind of done deal by any means. It's not like that's a slam dunk argument, but at least it's a way of understanding what's being said there. Then if you go down to chapter five, verse um, 17, it refers to the elders again. It says the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. And what that verse shows you is that the elders, the role of the elders is to direct the affairs of the church. And some of them preach and teach, but not all of them. So you can, have a, you can have an elders group in which some people preach and teach and some people don't preach and teach, right? Because it says the elders who direct the affairs of the church are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. So it just brings you back then to thinking of what did in this particular church in Ephesus, what did the elders do? Well, the main thing that they did was they directed the affairs of the church. In other words, they made sure that the church was doing the things that the church needed to do. And Timothy is being told that he needs to be very careful about who these people are because there's this problem of false teaching that's going on um, in this community, this, co this way of thinking that forbids marriage and emphasizes ascetic practices in which people are you know, not eating, you know, food. They're kind of fasting all the time or something like that. Okay, so that was quite a lot of information. It's like drinking from a fire hydrant. Now, it's in that context of all of this that I think we need to go back and try to understand why in this case, and I think it's only in this case, Paul thinks that the women in Ephesus shouldn't teach. And I believe it's to do with the fact that they have been either the targets of or have been particularly caught up in the false teaching that's happening in Ephesus. Um, now, you need to keep in mind that in the ancient world, um, there, it was just a much less kind of egalitarian world than we live in. It was much more structured, much more kind of layers of society. You know, if you lived in the Roman Empire, this idea that you know, there's the emperor and his family at the top of the pyramid, then there's the kind of equestrian class who are like the nobles, they live in Rome and so on. And then there's, you know, scattered throughout the cities, there's sort of the, the high, high ranking citizens and so on. And you go down through society and um, at the bottom of society, there are slaves that are kind of like the, you know, massive, the, the economy of the, of the Roman empire was built on slave labor. And the Roman empire couldn't have existed without uh, slave labor. So it's a very hierarchical society. But within each layer of society, men and women are also kind of in a hierarchy with men always above the women. In, so the equestrian men are above the equestrian women. And then the sort of trade level or the sort of merchant class, um, the men are above the women. Then the trade and the sort of artisan 
that men are above the women and so on. So it's kind of this layering of society all the way through. And one of the, one of the um, effects of this for women is that women were often not educated to anything like the level that the men would have been. And this would apply even in Jewish communities and, even, and in the um, early Christian communities, many of which um, had a lot of a strong Jewish presence. It's not that the women weren't educated to a certain level. They would have been taught, say, in Jewish communities, women would know how to read. But they would only have a basic um, education. And it was this idea that, um, you know, there's strictly determined domestic roles the role of women is sort of a domestic role. It's about women, it's about children and the home and so on. And the men's role is to kind of be like, you know, the, the, the one in the book of Judges, you know, they sit at the gate and they talk about important things and they run society and that sort of thing. So there was a very kind of structured view of things. Now, in this case here in, in Ephesus, we've got a situation, I think, where the women have been uh, specifically targeted, um, and they are being offered a kind of version of the gospel in which there's a kind of liberation, you could say, maybe it's a sort of a, a liberation that comes from saying to them that, um, you know, the whole world of domestic life is actually not something that Christians should value. Um, and so, therefore, also having babies, having children and being a mother is not something that's being valued. So remember it said the, these teachers forbid marriage. Well, what would happen if you forbid marriage? It would mean that the women were not having children. And so there's this, that would free them up presumably to focus their life on the mind. Um, and be freed from the structures of sort of and the restrictions and the incredible burden, especially in the ancient world of domestic life. And so um, in a situation, so, so Paul is in a situation where he is saying to Timothy, look, I don't permit women to preach, to, to teach or to have authority over a man. What I'm saying is that um, Paul seems to be excluding a particular kind of teaching. It's the sort of teaching that is domineering and in which the woman has this kind of domineering authority over men. Now, what I was saying is that I think that this is a specific situation. One of the reasons why I think it's a specific situation is because there's the presence of false teaching, right? This whole thing about forbidding marriage but also because Paul's way of reading the book of Genesis is surprising. Okay, so look at the way that he, his exegesis of, the, of this, the story of the fall. Okay, so that's what he's talking about. He says, Adam was formed first, then Eve. Okay, so he's making the point that there is, you know, because Adam is first, then Eve, that means that man is always first and the woman is always sort of secondary. Um. In another passage, though, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul modifies that by saying, but actually, men came from women ever since, so it kind of balances out, which, you know, most women would immediately say. It's like, okay, the first man was first, but ever since then, you know, men haven't been able to come into the world without a woman's help. So, um, so it's, it's a slightly surprising point that Paul makes. Um, but there's an even more surprising point that he makes. He says, Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. Okay. Now, if you go back to the story of, of the Garden of Eden, you could say, yep, the woman was deceived. But um, the man isn't somehow off the hook. In yeah. fact, with and completely open eyes, he just does what he knows is the wrong thing to do. Um, but I think that the point that we need to notice here is back in chapter four again, where it's talking about these uh, false teachers. If you go back to chapter four, verse one, it says, 
the Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits. So Paul is concerned that in this situation that's happening in Ephesus, a group of women are being deceived. And Paul has gone to the Old Testament to find a story in which a woman is deceived. And he's saying, look, here's the lesson for us. Um, and it's right back in, in the story of the Garden of Eden. And he's making an argument from that passage for this, this specific situation. Now, it's a surprising move that he makes because, you know, as I said, many people who read the story of, of the uh, Garden of Eden might actually say that Eve was less to blame for what happened than Adam. And Adam had no excuse for, um, for just going along with what, uh, what was being suggested without being deceived with a completely open, you know, with open eyes, he did exactly the wrong thing. Now, the other thing to keep in mind and to remember is that in Romans chapter five, when Paul is also talking about the story of the fall, remember he, there he talks about how Adam, uh, brought sin into the world and death came through Adam and now Christ has come into the world and life comes into the world through Christ. You can see there that in that context, Paul leaves Eve out of the story altogether and blames it all 100% on Adam. Adam's blame for death coming into the world and uh, for sinning. And he even is he, he even mentioned. Paul is doing what you might think of as a kind of flexible exegesis because he's got a specific problem that he is trying to address. And the specific problem that he's addressing is this false teaching that denies the value of, um, of sex, of marriage, of having children. And then so notice another very surprising thing about this passage in 1 Timothy, because it then goes on to say one of the most unexpected things that, you know, the whole New Testament has, because it says not right, you know, right after saying it was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But then it says, but women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. And that is a very surprising thing to say, especially for Paul to say, Paul is the one back in Romans 5 who said, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Paul is the one who says in Galatians that we are not justified by works. We are justified by faith in Christ. Um, so it's very surprising to have him say in this passage, but women will be saved through childbearing. And I think, again, this has to do with the fact that he's saying in this context that the women shouldn't be um, afraid of embracing their role within the home as those who have children. So in other words, marriage is a good thing. Childbearing is a good thing. And the women will be saved in the context of their ongoing roles, uh, their domestic roles that they have in our community is what Paul is saying in this situation. Now, there's a lot of debate around what saved means. It can mean something like the women will be kept safe during childbearing. You'll recall that the story of the fall is where you have the introduction of this idea of um, childbearing being uh, very difficult and this terrible uh, pain in childbearing. But there's also another thing that's said in that state, in, in the, the story of the Garden of Eden, and that is that the enmity um, that has been created between the woman, the woman's seed and the serpent and the serpent seed is, is something that's, you know, it's going to ultimately um, come to an end because the serpent, the, the woman's seed, the woman's offspring, the child, essentially, the is going to crush the head of the serpent one day. And it could be that that's what's being referred to here, where it says that the woman will be saved through the childbearing you know, through having a child that eventually comes and destroys the deceiver in the world. So it could be a reference to that. The problem is, is that it's very unclear what it refers to.
But I think that it has to do with the fact that there are these false teachers in Ephesus who are sort of setting the women up, deceiving them by saying to them, look, your domestic role as mothers is something that you should abandon and you should um, be kind of like free spirits in, in the world in which you don't get married, you don't have children, and then you can join this elite group of people that are just sort of super spiritual, hyper spiritual. And we know that this kind of hyper spirituality was an issue in Corinth, uh, we know that in the later um, generations of the church, there was this movement called Gnosticism, which emphasized the idea that the body is a bad thing. Domestic life is a bad thing. We should try to escape um, the sort of in, the embodied life that humans live. So, friends, all of that is to say that I think there's a specific reason why Paul um, doesn't want the women in Ephesus to teach. but you step back from it a little bit, you could say, Paul um, does envisage, envisage a situation in which um, there is kind of group leadership within the community. That group, commu that group leadership in Paul's mind is, is something that is, um, you know, people need to kind of be qualified for it, even though it's not like strict, like, yeah, you know, you get ordained or something, but you know, there is a kind of recognition that certain people need to be of a certain quality. Those people can be thought of as overseers or supervisors and helpers or servants or deacons. And within that group, there are both men and women. Um, what explicitly the men and women do is not spelled out, though it includes things like caring for the church. You know, they care for the affairs of the church. And some of them preach and teach. It doesn't specifically say how many of them preach and teach, but some of them do, and clearly other ones don't. So what I want to say about all of this is that, um, you know, Paul's churches did have a kind of emerging sense of how, you know, of some kind of structure, but there doesn't seem to be an absolutely clear-cut rule about how that should be organized. And let me just give you one more example of, of a church that's got both its categories of overseers and deacons. And that is um, the Philippians. You know that, you know, Philippi was another very, one of Paul's very important um, church of Paul's. So if you go over to Philippians chapter one, you'll see that Paul uses the same two terms right in the greeting of the, of the letter. It says, Paul and Timothy, interesting that Timothy is involved there as well. Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ. There Paul calls himself a, a servant. Um, and that's the word slave that's being used there. So um, that's kind of an interesting thing. He says, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus in Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace. So Paul explicitly refers to these two kinds of groups. And he uses the same words, episkopos and diakonos, the supervisors and the helpers. And they make up the kind of leadership of the church in Philippi. Now, what is also interesting, I think, about the Philippians, about the Paul's letter to the Philippians, is when you go through Philippians, you'll see that the problem there is that there is some kind of argument that's happening in the church. And Paul urges them over and over to be of one mind. So you'll see that, you know, at the, in chapter one um, or beginning of chapter two, he says, um, chapter two, verse two, he says, make my joy complete by being of one mind, having the same love, being one in spirit and being of one mind. Okay, so there's one mind. Um, that is the issue in Philippi. And then if you go down to chapter four, you find that Paul addresses two people specifically and says, you two need to be of one mind. And that is chapter four, verse two. He says, I plead, I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Now, the thing that's interesting about that is that the whole of Philippians is about 
being of one mind. And when he gets to the end of the letter, he actually identifies two people. It's almost as if they are the key issue. These two individuals are somehow at the heart of the disagreement that's happening in the church. And it's interesting that they are women. Euodia and Syntyche, those are feminine names. These are two women in the church that are probably among that, that group that's referred to in the very first verse there where he says, together with the overseers and deacons. I think there's a very strong likelihood that Euodia and Syntyche are part of the leadership group of the church, whether they're overseers or deacons, of course, isn't made clear. But Paul wouldn't have addressed them by name if they were just sort of unimportant people in the church. He addresses them by name because, in fact, they are part of the leadership community. Um, but as I've said, I think that in all Paul's churches, these groups were informal. They were kind of somewhat loose, um, whether someone was technically an elder or technically um, you know, uh, uh, an overseer or whatever might not be something that had to be kind of pronounced. It might just be something that was recognized um, among them as a community. But in Paul's letter to Timothy, Paul is saying to Timothy, look, you need to have good people that you can rely on that can steer the church in a, a healthy way. And Paul uses this idea of healthy teaching. Uh, rather than corrupt teaching or sick teaching that's going to lead people off in wrong directions. So, friends, that's an example of the kind of um, thinking I suppose you would, you would uh, have when you think about these letters that Paul wrote to these churches. And you could do the same thing with other passages um, that, you know, are about women and leadership and so on. Um, and so I'm going, to pull, I'm going to stop there. I know I've gone on for an awful long time. You guys have been amazing. You might want to stand up and have a drink of water or something like that, stretch your legs, and then we'll spend some time just talking about it and I'm happy to answer questions. But um, basically what the point that I'm trying to make is that, is that um, Paul's um, sort of forbidding of women to teach in Ephesus is a specific case. Um, of a problem in a particular community, um, but that, that the broader context is of this kind of shared group of people that together were thought of as caring for the welfare of these communities. Okay, so let me stop there. Maybe I'll hand it over to you, Ron, if you want to just see if people want to have a break or if they want to just, if we want to just carry right on or whatever you like. Well, you go. Yeah. No, we don't give breaks around here. We just write <laughs> we just right through. Yeah. Saskatchewan people have got bladders of steel, I guess. <laughs> and so I, I have a question, but I'm going to wait. You know, somebody asked some questions, and a call of the passage that he shared or another passage that comes to mind. Uh, any, any questions? Yeah. Go ahead. Right off the bat, you're, you're, we're, we're having you speak to us about what do we do that women or women preaching and uh, teaching and stuff like that. But right off the bat, you said that your wife is a pastor. Yep. So those of us who disagree with it, we're already in a steep learning curve. Yep. So my, my uh, wife uh, is a pastor of family ministries. She, um, she cares for the children's and young young adult you know the young young people at uh, foothills and at and now at north shore alliance um but i think that uh you know even your church would allow for a woman to be the someone who's uh, a director of family ministries i think oh, yeah. i don't know but um so yeah i mean my my case isn't really what's at issue here you know i mean um, I've got my own views. I, 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 I agree with women being um, um, elders. I agree with women being able to preach and so on. Um, so happy to, you know, happy to say that. But yeah, Bronwyn's own role is as a pastor of um, family ministries. And, um, you know, she works under the authority of the pastors and the elders board and so on. So it's not a, not a particularly... Um, you know, kind of difficult case, I don't think. 
We have Bronwyn Air here in uh, Saskatchewan. Oh, you didn't catch that. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, we have a Bronwyn Air in uh, Saskatchewan as a member of our Legislative Assembly. Brilliant. Good, good name. <laughs> Any other question? One that I'll have is when you walk through in, in Timothy, would that be the same circumstances or similar circumstances in the first Corinthians 14 passage where it says, Yeah, that, um, for women not permitting women to speak, that Paul was actually writing to a specific situation that needed correction versus yeah. a uh, being prescriptive. So, um, if you have a look at that, you'll, you know, if you have a look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 um, and um, ver uh, verses 34 and 35, um, the situation there has to do with women being disruptive in, in, a, in church. And this, I think, has to do with this issue of people not being educated and not understanding what's going on and so on. And so... Women should remain silent in church. They're not allowed to speak, must, must be in submission. Um, if they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home for it's disgraceful for women to speak in the church. And, and the whole context here is about orderliness. Remember, it's talking a lot about the gifts of the spirit. And Paul is concerned, I think, that women are uh, sort of, the women that don't understand necessarily what's going on are, are disrupting the church. It's not talking about someone who, like in a, in a modern day church, where the women are as educated as the men, have also gone to Bible college, have also, you know, kind of are fully sort of apprised of what's going on, who stand up in the same orderly way as anyone else and, um, and speak in the church. Now, remember that in 1 Corinthians itself, in chapter 11, um, where it's talking about head coverings and all of that. That's another sort of tricky passage. It yeah. talks about women praying and prophesying in churches. And Paul takes that as something that's completely legitimate and, and appropriate. So that's why I think that he's talking here just about this kind of disruptive speech, because Paul does allow for women to pray and prophesy. And of course, you can't pray and prophesy without speaking. So um, women did, in fact, pray and prophesy in Paul's churches. Um, but what he didn't want them to do was to be allowed to kind of disrupt things. So again, here, I would think, you know, don't think of a church service like, you know, Yorkton Alliance, where I assume you've got nice pews or chairs and rows and that sort of thing. You know, you think of a gathering of people that's informal, it's in someone's home, it could be kind of chaotic, and Paul is trying to keep getting, and you know, there's gifts of the spirits going on, and Paul is trying to wrestle the thing into some kind of order. And uh, it's in that context that he, um, that he says this. Now, having said all of that, I do think that Paul was a, was a conservative person. Like, I think that Paul did have a conservative outlook in terms of, um, you know, kind of the, the role of men as leaders in, in, in society and that sort of thing. We know that Paul had conservative views on government, like in chap Romans chapter 13, Paul makes it very clear that he thinks that um, the government authorities come from God and, you know, people should, should honor the government, you know, should honor the emperor and that sort of thing. And um, Paul also has very conservative views on slavery. So here's another, this is another kind of classic case, right? Where it's important not to just take what's happening in a church at a particular time and then say, okay, that's the rule for ever, for all time, you know, and everywhere. In Paul's letters, several times he says to the slaves who are part of these household communities that they should obey their masters. Um, and yet, of course, we all know that when, um, when the fight to abolish slavery happened in, the, you know, in England, first of all, and then later on in the United States, it was Christians reading the Bible who fought against slavery. And why was that? Because as we did here, they could see the bigger picture, the bigger framing context, and they could say, even though in, the, in those instances, those churches had slaves and even told their slaves to be obedient, yet by the same argument in many ways, you know, where Paul says, you know, in Christ, there's neither slave nor free, it lays the foundation 
own practices. It lays the foundation on slavery. And I would say that the same thing applies in the case of women in ministry. If we've got a view that this is the body, I was going to speak to them about when uh, uh, Martha and, uh, and Mary, uh, House of Lazarus, that uh, it was more important for Jesus to have Mary listening and learning, right? So when we talk about the women being un uneducated, even Jesus felt that it was very important uh, for them to be educated. Again. Guys, you missed the good stuff again. <laughs> Ron, are you there? I think you're, 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 you're muted. Ron's screen is muted. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's happened twice. Um, one of the other passages that might come into play here is the Ephesians um, 5 passage of, do you see a, a, a separate discussion of the role of women within the household marriage situation oh, yeah. versus the uh, the church, the participation and leadership in the church. Do I see a difference? Yeah. For instance, can 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 a husband and wife negotiate their relationship within the home, and it can look different than, but it's, but that's not prescriptive for the church in leadership that this passage in Ephesians is talking about a different topic in terms of the relationship of men and women? Yeah, I would say they're overlapping topics because, um, you know, a lot of the metaphors or the imagery for the church in the New Testament is sort of family kind of imagery. But you've got these two spheres, I guess you could say. There's the church of the so there's the sphere of the ecclesia, the, the church, and then there's the sphere of the oikos, which is the home. And they do overlap, but in both cases, you just hear even in the Ephesians passage, you know, I, in my Bible, uh, 521 is the beginning of the paragraph, you know, whereas in others, it's the end of the previous paragraph. But if that's the beginning of the paragraph, it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so there, there's an example of how you've got a framing um, principle, submit to one another. And then within that submitting to one another, wives submit to husbands and husbands love your wives. These are not seen to be like one's more important than the other one. In fact, in this context, the husband gives his life for the wife. He gives himself, is a servant. So here's the other thing that I think it's really important to remember. You know, back in the first Timothy passage, it says that the woman is not allowed to have authority, you know, kind of have this domineering authority. But so what that means is that we should have elders boards that are not domineering authoritarian boards. They, we shouldn't think of it as authority groups, but as servant groups. Because remember, Jesus said that among you, even though, you know, among the Gentiles, they lorded over one another and so on. But among you, the one who's going to be the leader of all is the servant of all. And surely we aren't going to say that women can't serve anybody. I mean, we'd all be in a big, big, big problem if we said, if we said that. Let's just be real. Um, women uh, certainly have always served, and as as men serve, it's it's about how you define. You know, what is an elder? Is an elder the boss? Is an elder the authority figure? Um, or is an elder someone whose role it is is to steer and care for the church. Now, of course, there are times when decisions have to be made. Paul acts in authoritative ways as an apostle and so on. So it's not to say that there aren't times when decisions have to be made, but the New Testament's picture of group leadership really is what, because the, there's always a plural, you know, when Paul talks to the overseers and deacons or in, in that's in Philippi or in, in Ephesus in First Timothy, it's a group of people, right? It's not like he has a person who's a kingpin and uh, you have to worry about that person having overbearing authority. It's, it's about serving um, within a community that's defined by their relation to Christ. So I think that 
the, um, the Ephesians 5 passage is kind of an example, you could say, of a parallel sphere, the sphere of the family. Um, and there's some similar dynamics that have to be worked out there as well. But you don't want to have a situation where, for example, a woman, a woman's submission doesn't mean that she has to put up with abuse, for example, nor does it mean that the woman never gets, has any say or that the only decisions that are ever made are only made by the man. I mean, I can't imagine living in a house where I had to make every decision. I would be crazy. Um, it's a negotiated space of mutual love and affection and submission to each other. Even if, you know, at certain points you might say, look, you know, here in this rare occasion, if, if that's your view of things, you know, the man has to decide, maybe that happens once in a while. I don't know, but um, it's, it's always about a mutuality. And I think that the same applies in the body of Christ in, because, you know, if you think about the body of Christ teaching that we have in first Corinthians 12 and, and so on. Um, Paul explicitly says that one part of the body shouldn't say to another one, I don't need you, or, you know, I'm, I'm the only thing that's important around here. Um, but in the Ephesus case, there is clearly, it shows you one of the functions of the elders or of the leadership group is to protect the church from false teachers and from deceiving and so on. And there could be rules in which a person is not allowed to teach. Um, and Paul identifies the women in that setting is like, no, they shouldn't be allowed to teach. They should, you know, do other things. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and, and, you know, in other places um, in first Corinthians, Paul kicks people out of the church. In fact, he does that in, in first Timothy as well. So there, there can be times when there's an authority function that, that happens. Um, but in the Alliance, for example, that very strict authority function in some ways is, um, you know, you wouldn't, like say Ron thought someone should be booted out of the church, he'd probably reach out to Bernie Vanderwall to help him, partly because Bernie Vanderwall is a really big guy. But, you know, like um, he's, you know, there's a sense in which each group works out its own structure. And in the Alliance, um, the kind of the, the role that the Apostle Paul played, for example, is now not so much in the local church. That's maybe the role that's being played by the DS or maybe it's being played by the president of the denomination or whatever. But it's not as if that's the only way to do it. Right. So what I'm saying is that the New Testament gives a range of ways of doing it. And it really is up to individual groups and fellowships and families of churches and so on to, you know, in, in a prayerful, considered way, um, seek to, to be the body of Christ for, for each other, but also for your town. Like, how are, how are you going to reach out to Yorkton? How are you going to reach out to the, to the surrounding um, rural lands? Like, how are you going to draw people in and, and be a witness to them of the, the life of the Spirit in your community? Is it going to be through, um, you know, kind of a particular hierarchical structure? Is that going to be the thing that that is really key, or or some other uh, um, structure? That that's the thing that I think is key for you all to work out together. Um, the New Testament doesn't call us to a place of fear or legalism, you know, where we're like, if I make a mistake, we're going to lose the blessing of God. You know, I, I don't think that that's the case. I think it's the case that the Lord says, um, I am there with you in your midst. And um, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So my, well, I would urge you to kind of come to a place of freedom among yourselves, you know, kind of a considered, careful, um, spirit-filled um, body of Christ way of thinking about this. And realize that you know you're you're in you're within a framework of a broader community as well. You belong to other churches. You belong to the alliance, and that can all be um, a, a resource for you as well. Any other questions that somebody has here? Well, I'm a little concerned the way this discussion goes, in so much as that it sounds like we're determining what we will allow 
in the church for what women will do or are able to do, as opposed to um, are we recognizing that the Holy Spirit calls and gets men and women equally? Yeah. Really great. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, sorry, the, the way that I started this, you know, what one of those points that I made in the beginning, the introductory points was just, was precisely about that, is to say that the framework within which we talk about the church is that this is the community of those who are gifted and called by the Holy Spirit that we are part of the body of Christ and we are under obligation. That's what I said. We're under obligation to live into the gifts and calling that we've received. Um, and so I think that's the starting point, you know, um, and it would only be, I, so the way that I would see it, it would only be in an exceptional case where a person would be told, look, you can't do this thing. Um, if they're gifted, gifted and called to do a thing, then they should they should do that thing. That that would be my starting point. If a person is gifted and called, um, then that's what they should do because that's that's the ultimate mark of of authority. Um, if the Holy Spirit gifts a person to be to speak prophetically, then they aren't just doing that as themselves. They're doing that as a gift to the whole church. They're, they are. Um, allowing God's blessings to flow through them to the church. If someone is gifted to be a servant or someone's gifted to be an administrator, or some people are really good at um, committee work, you know, elders boards are committees. You need some good committee people on that. And, um, you know, why would you want to have someone who's the best person at that excluded from the role because of a kind of, in a sense, a technicality in a way you could say, um, whereas you could invite them to function within the freedom of their gift and they could be a blessing to the church. And it doesn't even bring up the thing of whether they speak or teach or anything, um, because it could be that their role is to be, um, you know, to have that kind of a function. So I think that the key thing to really focus on is on the the way in which Christ um, is manifested and makes himself present among us through us. And he does it through giving us gifts of the spirit that enable us to live in this kind of new, a new society, a, a, a community that's a sign of the kingdom. Right? That's, a, that's a way of thinking about what the church is, that your, your community is a sign of the kingdom. Think of the parables of Jesus. It's like, the green shoots of the harvest, they, you know, the, 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 the harvest is, or the, the crop is growing. And it's you guys, <laughs> you are the growing crop of God's kingdom. It's, it's, it's happening right there. So do whatever you can to, to let the, the crop grow and to be fruitful and multiply. Um, and, you know, I think that's, that's the where to put the emphasis. That's, that's what I would, you know, advise. <laughs> Well, I, I really appreciate the uh, the insight that you're sharing when you draw on all the different passages together. But a lot of this question starts with can women be elders in our church, but also can women be senior pastors? And even with your response to my first question. I'm still seeing a place where people want to divide that question. People want to say, yes, women are equal, except for they're not senior pastors. They're, they're gifted and can participate in all aspects. I don't think many of us have a problem with that in, in this church. But if it comes to actual head authority, mm. that's, that's a divisive thing. Yep, it is. I think you guys will need to work that through among yourselves, really. I think it is possible to divide the question out. I think you you may, you know, kind of come to a conclusion like that. I think there's a number of folks within the Alliance that are doing it that way or saying women can be elders. They can, they can even be um, uh, ordained, um, but there will be a restriction on senior pastor. Um, 
I think that that would be something for you folks. You, you need to work that through and you, you know, kind of have your reasons for that. It, um, it wouldn't be the way that I would go, but that's fine. I, I, I'm not a part of your church in Yorkton, you know, and so you folks need to um, come to, to one mind. This is what Paul says, be of the same mind, like s- find a way to come together um, sort of on the, the very big subjects. And then it could be that you've, you've got a kind of an area where you say, okay, well, we've made a compromise. We weren't quite sure what to do. We'd, so we've said, here's an exclusion or something like that. But you know, I, th- that is something that you folks will need to work out together. I think what I've been talking about here is can women be elders? And um, I think the answer to that is, yes, they can be elders. That's, you know, that's my own conscience, you, you know, kind of as I've read the scriptures, as I've understood what it means to be an elder in the New Testament, that it's a shared um, function within these communities um, I don't see any reason to exclude women from being elders, but you folks will need to figure out how you apply that in your specific situation. Actually, I can be first. Sorry. All right. <laughs> hmm. Okay, now you can blame it on my wanting to have medical Sunday afternoon. Uh, and so I feel I may have missed something, but I also feel it may tie in with what Gary and Trisha may have been asking here. Um, at your point on 1 Timothy 5.17, where elders uh, with preaching and teaching, and it was just before that, and I, I'm sorry, I missed it, but how is it that we're bringing the women in as elders as well as deacons? I, I don't have a problem with them being deacons, but just how are we bringing uh, the women in the scripture as being elders. Where was that? Okay, it's because in the first part, in chapter three, it didn't talk about elders at all. It okay. talked about overseers and deacons. Oh, okay. And so, and then now it talks about elders. And I think that the, that the elders here includes the people that were mentioned in chapter three, the overseers and deacons. So, it's not, um, as I said at the time, it's not like that proves a point or anything, but it's, that's a possible way of seeing it, is that in Paul's churches, there were, um, the elders were made up of two groups, the overseers and the deacons. Okay. But it's just because that elders weren't mentioned in the first part. Yeah, I, I, I missed it. Also, that just it caught me when, when we hit that verse, it was just, Oh, it's like an aha moment for me or whatever. But it, it just, I missed the connection where, yeah, uh, the, what was being termed as elders. Yeah. All right, Trisha. Um, this isn't even really a question, it's just bringing up saying, like, this is a hard thing. And here's this hard thing is that I, I agree with the unity part and that we are called to be as one mind. Mm -hmm. And I want that. And I think that's so important. But then on the other end of the spectrum for me is like, what if we feel like, what if we in the end really strongly disagree with, with something like, um, and we just feel like the decision that our church comes to does not at all reflect the kingdom of God. Like in this case, we're talking about women, but let's say, let's go back to the slavery example. Yeah. So let's say it was, we were in a different context and I was sitting at a table and people were saying, you know, let's just get along, but you know what? We want to keep our slaves because we, yeah. we, we want to be rich still. And then it yeah. would be hard, it would be really hard for me just to just to say, well, let's keep it up then and smile and be a big family. Like I would I would have to say, this is not, this is not, this is not the kingdom. And this yeah. is detracting from from attracting my my daughters, my friends into the family of God. Yeah. You know, so it's that's that's the yeah, part that's... for me because it sounds really good, but and you do, and it is a detail. Like I do feel like this is a detail, but on the other hand, there's this. It's an important one. Though. Yeah, I think. Yeah. 
it, it were, and it's got nothing to do with this exactly, except for if women are going to Bible college and they come out and uh, professors are seeing them as being leaders and being uh, uh, good at what they're doing, top of their class, if the Alliance Church deems it that a woman cannot be a pastor, then I, as a woman, I'm not going to apply at the Alliance Church. I am going to go somewhere else where they are accepting of women and where I can have my own church. And so that's the conundrum of the Alliance Church. That's not our issue here at the moment, but you can very easily see that down the road, this is going to make an impact. And if we are to work together as one, and Genesis says that man needs a helper, then uh, you're going to lose all your helpers because you're not allowing them to do what God has given them in, in their history. Yeah, I think that this is a very, very important issue, and I'm really glad that it's been raised. Um, the unity that we seek is unity in the truth of the gospel. And it's not just a unity that allows, um, you know, a, a certain kind of um, either ideology or a certain group of people that are holding on to power to just be there's one or two people agree, therefore no one can do anything. And so I think it really does take, you know, the very hard work of working through what is, what is it that Christ is calling us to in the body of Christ here in Yorkton and, um, you know, praying that the Lord would bring a unity that is the gospel, not a unity of fear or one that's, you know, forced upon the community by, you know, um, voices that just refuse to to hear you know what's what seems to be the leading of the spirit um and then of course there could be dis difficult decisions that people have to make about whether they belong in a community or not and of course what you know you don't want to go that way but there could come a time when in in conscience for example in your example of the slavery where you just say i can't be a part of this community this doesn't at all seem to be true and right and and I don't want to be a part of it. So, you know, that can certainly happen and and would have to happen if, you know, if in some cases. But so I think you do have to be careful is that the unity thing can't be used as a trump card to let, you know, one or two or whatever people just stop the momentum of of, you know, the spirits leading because they just nope, I refuse and we're not going to do it and you know, that that could be a disaster. And so it will take, you know, real skill of leadership. Um, and, um, you know, there, there is a need for people to kind of focus in on what's really important. That's why you need some framing values. Like that, that's why I emphasize the point about the body of Christ and the empowerment of the spirit and the obligation that the spirit gives us, that we must do what we have been called to do. Um, and then, of course, also the freedom that comes from Christ saying, um, you know, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and so on. Um, but to recognize that the New Testament doesn't have a one, you know, doesn't have a strict rule about how churches should be set up. And so that means there is a kind of an open playing field with some principles that we can um, carefully work together, work on together. So but it's really important not to let the unity argument become a way to block the whole community from moving in a direction that is going. Well, Paul, thank you so much. We're approaching a 3.59 here, our time, 2.59 your time. I'm retired, I've lost time. And so, <laughs> I, again, thank you so much for your willingness to do this and be part of it. And um, if you'd be willing to uh, just close us in prayer, Yes, I'd love to. Thank you. All right. This may be opens up a whole other thing. But <laughs> in Genesis, when God creates Eden, he, he said, man needs a helper. Can you expand on what a helper would be? Is that an assistant or is that a partner or that to me was, and here's why I ask because this 
this is in the time of the kingdom of God. And that's, we believe we're in those times now as believers, but that was in the perfect time. And it would seem to me that the intention for women would be made just hinge on that word helper. You know, um, in my experience, there's never just one word or one sort of thing that's going to be the aha that sort of solves the whole thing. Um, it's about looking at all the different pieces together and, and weighing them, you know, wisely and so on. I think in that case, you know, people have talked about the fact that, you know, if taken out of the side of Adam indicates that she is, you know, to be with Adam as a partner, um, as a, a helping partner kind of a, a thing. Um, and that it's in the fall that the, uh, the hierarchy is sort of uh, made a big deal. You know, the idea that the woman is now going to be um, subjugated because of, of what's happened in the, in the fall. But I don't think that that's necessarily the only, you know, matter by any means. That that's one, one factor in the overall picture.